welcome to another episode of Butterfly Kisses, a journey of spiritual transformation. Today, I am joined with a very special guest. Her name is Allison Penna, and she is aka the Bad Widow. She's a lifelong New Yorker, a grief resilience coach, the number one best-selling author on Amazon, a global speaker and influence code consultant, and who also lives in Manhattan, one of my favorite cities to go visit. She was the primary caregiver for her husband of 25 years, David, who actually died in her arms at home after battling pancreatic cancer for 11 months. Allison learned a great deal about living fearlessly, even in the face of death itself. As a widow, she faced pervasive assumptions that she was broken by her loss, perhaps forever, Allison discovered she didn't know what she was without him and people who supported her either stepped up, stepped back or stepped out. As a result, she she was isolated and lonely but could not find resources to solve how to reconnect, get back to work and open up to love again. So she went out and created them. I love that, I love it. So she began badwidow.com and I love that name. <laughs> and it resonated for a lot of people who suffered a loss too. And as a lot of you know, I actually suffered a loss with my husband who passed away or refocused as I like to, to call it on June 5th of this year and uh, recon- or connecting here with Allison. We've had a lot, of, uh, a lot of similar circumstances and issues. So I would love to welcome Allison to Butterfly Kisses today, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about her story. So Allison, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Amy. My husband had pancreatic cancer, as you said, for 11 months. And one of the things that was confusing before he died was the doctor said, you know, slow down, do less you know, take a pause, you're going to have less energy, you're going to be able to do less. And for us, that made no sense. Mm -hmm. So for us, if you have a shorter lifespan than you expected, and it's predicted, basically, pancreatic cancer is one of the, the beasts in the cancer world. Why would you not live full tilt boogie to the end? And that's what we did. So that's what what we did. What did you do? I created an environment where I I cut out the things that we didn't love to the extent that it was possible. And I amplified the things we did love. So for me, it was leaning into community. I asked my community because I couldn't think. A hundred self-care practices. What were their best self-care tips? And they, they brought them. So then I didn't have to think something up when I couldn't think. I was exhausted. I was grieving even before he died, even before I became a widow. I was grieving the diminishment of this man I loved. And I just did things that mattered. I sang open mics. I did an open mic I did a a singing workshop and performed on stages in the time my husband was dying and since, because I knew if I didn't sing and if I didn't move the grief through my body, I wasn't going to survive his illness, much less after. How did you come up with that insight? Because in those times when really hard things have happened, my ability to sing has stopped. And, and music self-expression is really important to me, it always has been since I was a child. And so in this instance, so I had a brother who died when I was 25 and he was 23 and I couldn't sing after he died. And so the grief just got stuck. Mm-hmm. And I needed to have a way to move it through. And so from that time before, I knew that I would need to to keep moving the grief, keep moving it through. So I sang on stages and I cried through every rehearsal. Yeah. Every rehearsal. And I cried on stage because in this workshop that I did, 
what you what I had was I had three songs and then I had patter between and the patter between because I was singing about what was going on. And the singing was a reminder that I wasn't just a wife soon to be a widow. So one of the songs I sang was I am woman. The Tuesday before he died, I sang I will survive. Oh, wow. Because I needed to, to remember that I would. And, and there were times certainly that it did not feel like it. And I'm sure that you had times where it was so hard that I wasn't sure I was going to make it through. So we fought for his life for 11 months. And at the end, and it was clear to me, given that your show is Butterfly Kisses, there was a moment where he might have been able to fight his way back. And he chose not to. And I could feel that time. And he said, you know, Allison, I just can't. And from that moment, it started going faster. The other thing is he was at home when he died and he was six foot three, I'm five foot three. So in order for him to actually die at home, I said, honey, I will do this for as long as I can, but if this is what you want, then it needs to go faster. And it began going faster. Now, it was not my choice, it was his choice before I said that. But it was an honoring of what, what he was feeling, what he wanted. So at the end, there was nobody in the house except the two of us, and I was holding him in my arms. And I weighed, by the time he died, 30 pounds more than he did. And his bones were so brittle that I would have broken them if I had put weight on him. And so his head was on my shoulder and I was holding him. And I said, you know, stay as long as you want, leave when you want. And he kept asking me, he was talking to me really right before he died. You know, what about my mom? What about my paintings? What about you? What about the studio? And I'm like, I'll take care of it. I've got it. I've got it. And the last words I said to him were, in a body, you need breath and love. Outside of a body, all you need is love. So when you're ready, go out on the love. And literally holding him, immediately after that, he took four breaths and went out on the love. And I was a widow. That is so amazing that you could give that to him. That is it, so, so much love and so much caring and respect between two souls is that's just beautiful. That is so beautiful. It was incredible. And then the next thing that happened, a friend of mine called right at that moment, I'm still holding him. He's just left. And I started rushing into, okay, I've got to call the crematorium and I've got to call his mother and I've got to call my mother and I've got to, and I was just launching into this craziness right after this moment. And my girlfriend said, you don't have to do any of that. She said, you can take all the time you need. And so I just held him for an hour before I called anybody. And then I, I let him go and he just lay there. And I eventually called my mom, eventually called his mom. And I walked around the house with him just in the house. And I gave myself that time. And it was, it's, it's one of the acknowledgements in the book that she told me not to rush back. 
to care for myself right after that time. Yeah, it's, it's a hard transition when that happens going from being a wife to being a widow. And I don't know if I even like that word widow because I still see myself as being a wife. <laughs> it's just different now. So yeah. I still feel him around. I still hear him. I still see him. I still experience him. It's just different. So. It's different. And, and there is, as a human, losing the physicality mm -hmm. yeah. is really hard. In the first, I wasn't sleeping. You know, first of all, I had been waking up in the night to make sure that he was alive for months and months and months. So I was not sleeping well anyway. But then after he died, there would be that moment in the morning where I could feel his warmth at my back. I could feel him there. And then I would wake up and I would realize that he was gone and my heart would break all over again. And people said, well, if you're tired, why don't you take a nap? And I said, I can't do that more than once a day. I can't. And that was a number of months that it was like that. When you're sleeping, it's easier, I guess. And then you wake up. So yeah, I get that. Well, and I also think that the lines are less strongly drawn mm -hmm. when you're sleeping. So the communication is actually easier. Mm -hmm. My mother-in-law is 98 and she believes none of this, but she periodically says to me, you know, I, I was dreaming of Dave and he was talking to me. And I said, yeah, he, that's real. Oh, no, no, it's just a dream. and. I said, it's also real. I mean, it's a dream, but it's also real. Yeah. Why do you call yourself the bad widow? Bad widow. So a good widow just goes along. Oh, thank you so much for your help. But what I found was that people got things wrong a lot. They said the wrong things. They did the wrong things. Everybody has an opinion. Yes. Everybody has an opinion. And there's this period of time, or at least there was for me, where it's really hard for me to make decisions when I wasn't the same person. I, Dave and I were together for 25 years. So that was about half my life. And in that course of time, our lives had, had wound together. And so... The, the me of who I was was less clear than the we of us. And I really had to disentangle that and figure out who I was without him. I knew who I was with him, but after he died, there was the, like this wasteland of grief. I couldn't see a future because I had this future planned out with this man. And then it was just gone. So what did the future hold and who was I? And did I, one of the mistakes that people make after grieving a loss is there's this, I think it's a very American thing that you can just bounce back. There's no back to bounce to because not only is that person go gone or or you've experienced some other loss, but you're not the person that you were with them because wife to widow. So bad widow was about all these assumptions that people had that I was intent on blowing up because they got in the way of communication, of actually talking about what it was like from inside the raw piece. We're so uncomfortable with emotions, tears and anger. The first year, wasteland of grief, crying all the time. Second year, zero to rage in five seconds. And 
you would sometimes hear, oh, I didn't mean to make you cry. And I would think I got bigger problems than you. <laughs> but it's common. It's a, a platitude that people say, and they don't actually hear themselves. But if someone's just gone through a loss, they're thinking, yeah. Or they'll say, how are you? And I would think, well, the man I loved for 25 years just died in my arms. I'm terrified about my future. I can't work because my energy is variable. My memory has gaps in it you could drive a truck through and I had the attention span of a fruit fly. So I was a coach who couldn't coach. I was an editor and proofreader who had no memory. And it was even the basic things, the things that you think you should be able to remember. So early days, I couldn't remember. To, I had five seconds once I remembered that I was hungry to get to the kitchen before I forgot again. Five seconds. And so as I was going through this, I thought, you know, there must be other people going through this as well. I can't be the only one. But the only resources I could find were there were grief counselors. Here's how you move through the feelings. And I wasn't interested in suppressing the feelings or wallowing in, in them. You know, neither of those are very useful ways to move through grief. But if you don't move the grief, you're stuck with one of those options. Now, if you skate over the grief, volcanoes fester and the explosion is not pretty. So skating over grief doesn't get rid of it, it postpones it. I have had people write me since the writing of my book saying, I now understand why I've been grieving for 40 years, 15 years. Now my kids are raised, I'm ready to start living again. So the grieving is a lifetime. But if you skate over the grief at the beginning, the consequences are really bad. If you wallow in the grief, you can get stuck there. So one of the things that I do with clients is they need to, to re-engage in life at a certain point. It's kind of where I come in because when we're hurt, we contract. Totally natural. And then in a, a healthy way, you'll integrate what happened, actually allow the feelings to be there, allow yourself to be how you are, and then expand. Stay there, expand. But after a loss, when you're grieving, that's not something that happens automatically. It's actually a choice. If you don't make that choice, you're more likely to have a smaller life than before the loss. And the possibility is to have a bigger one. So that's what I call re-engage. And that's just push out, push out on existing boundaries. I couldn't work. So one of the things I decided to do was start to try to work. I had a widow friend who had a Halloween pop-up store and she hired me four hours a day two days a week, which was all I could do, all I had energy for, to hang costumes in her pop-up store. I couldn't think, I had no memory, I had very little energy, but I could do that. And the idea was just to start building back the muscles of I am a person and a capable person to build back my confidence because I had to start somewhere and I couldn't bounce back but I could build from something if I just was brave and began. The second thing I had to do was reinvent myself. Who was I after? And that was what I was describing, that the untangling, what was his, what was mine, what was ours. 
and re-choosing what I was going to go forward with. My husband didn't love the open mics, so I did less and less of that as our years went on. I took it back. He loved tennis. I didn't. I let that go. I don't blame you. (laughs) Yeah, but it was like, okay, do I like this? Do I not like this? It was as fast as I could. Just making decisions, trying to redefine myself and figure out who I was as quickly as I could. Uh, Because otherwise I was just going back to the old track and I no longer fit that track. One of the things that happened in those 11 months is what really mattered to me rose up to the surface and what really mattered to him. And we started prioritizing that. And I wasn't going to give that up. So Bad Widow came out of I will speak my truth, whether you like it or not. So when people said, how are you? Instead of saying, oh, I'm fine, thank you, with my teeth gritted. I said, actually, I can't answer that because the future I imagined is gone. What I can answer is, how are you right now? Or how are you today? So what I discovered was in a shorter time horizon, I could answer. And that was really useful. And people were very grateful to have a way that they could support me that was supportive because they were doing their best. Yeah. You know, people mean to be kind. They just don't understand because I don't think we're, we're actually taught how to grieve and how to support someone who is grieving as well. And there's, there's not a, there's not a class in school, at least I didn't attend one <laughs> that I remember on, on how to grieve. And it, it's, it's difficult to, to go through that process. And it's something that we all go through. Yes, this is the, this is kind of the myth. Grief is a universal experience for everyone. So if you've lost a pet, a job, a business, a relationship, if you've been divorced, if you've lost a person to death, if you've lost a person to illness, you have grieved a loss. Universal experience, except we pretend that's not true, which is honestly crazy. So if you look at the last 20 months of the pandemic, people are grieving being divided from family, being divided from friends, having a divided country. All of these things are grief experiences. And we don't have a language or are not well-versed in communicating about what that really is like. And honestly, I think that the great resignation that they're talking about is about grief, is about these 20 months raising up what matters and recalibrating people's lives. And I think it's about grief and loss. That's my honest opinion. I, 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 I'm, I'm with you on that one. I really believe that is, that is true as well. That's a really yeah. good point. Mm-hmm. 176,000 people in the US have died of COVID. Each of those people, I was reading an article, is, has impacted at least eight others. So if you go 176,000 times eight, that's the universe of people a universe of people grieving in a culture that has no way to support them. The holidays are coming up. Holidays are rough. You know, you're with family and friends maybe that you haven't seen in a year. They don't quite know what to do or say. And typically after someone has lost a person, what happens is people don't talk about it because they don't want to provoke tears. They're scared of tears because they think that tears mean you're not okay. So I have some tips for your audience about how to handle the holidays. Plan ahead. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Plan ahead. So what will you do if the tears are not controllable? The anger is not controllable. It's not just settle down. It's not, I didn't mean to make you cry. They just show up. 
and then they're there. But what I discovered was that the people at the places where I was going, they just wanted to know that I was okay. And they wanted to know what to do if this happened. And so I called the hosts and I said, you know, in the course of, of this party, I might cry. What I want you to know is I'm okay. You don't need to fix me. And one of the greatest gifts that you could give me is just to allow me to be as I am. Because a lot of these occasions, you go into them and they're, they're places where you're meant to be happy. And after a loss, happiness and sadness ride together pretty often. So for me, a lot of the time when joy rose, grief rose at the same time. But we're trained that joy needs to come on its own or it's not joy. And it's not true in my experience. Once they knew I was okay, and once they knew what to do with me or not do with me, it was okay. For the person grieving, how will you handle it? Are you comfortable crying in front of people? Do you need to excuse yourself? If you have a plan before you go there, in the middle of the tsunami, you're not trying to figure it out. So it makes a huge difference to everybody's comfort. That's a really good idea. Because everyone means well. They're just, typically they're giving their best guess at what they would want in your situation. And they have no idea. Yeah. Everybody grieves differently. Everybody grieves differently. The journey is really unique. So reinvent was the second. So reengage, reinvent, and then rebuild. So people step up, step back, and step out. And largely it happens when the emotions are, are raging. So someone will come up to you and you'll burst into tears and they'll think they did something wrong. So they'll leave or they'll step back. If a person who's grieving can't be pretty clear about what they actually need, nobody will do anything because nobody wants to get it wrong with a widow. They will say things like, let me know if there's anything you need, I'm here. And when people would say that to me right after my husband died, I would think I'd like my husband back, please. Which is impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Right? The one thing I want, bring him back. The one thing. Yep. Yeah. And so what I started to advise people was, okay, if you have a person in your life that you're trying to support who's just had this experience, what I recommend is just talk to them, find out what's going on. And then based on what you hear, suggest something that you might be able to do. If they have kids and they haven't had a shower in a week, because they're so extra tending because those people have lost their father, hey, why don't I take the kids for three hours so you can just stand in the shower and cry without scaring the children? I have an example of this that I use a lot. I, my family helped me with rent after Dave died. I live in New York City. My husband also had a studio. So two incomes to one income, two places to pay for in Manhattan. My husband's studio to empty, 500 square foot studio that he was in for 30 years with hundreds of paintings. And so they helped me out with rent for a period of time. And so March came along and my landlord called and said, where's the rent? I said, oh, you know, it's all taken care of. She said that ended in February. It was March 23rd. No clue where my rent was going to come from. And so I wrote a blog post, which was not a, a poor me or anything like that. It was, oh, wow, this has just happened still on my website, it's called Grief, Brain and Bills. And I said, this just happened, this is crazy. So if you know someone that's going through this kind of experience, here's what I recommend. Listen to what they have to say, make a suggestion of what you could do based on what they said, 
So not your good idea, what they said, and then execute with direction as needed. Within 30 minutes, I got a Facebook message from my college roommate who I had not seen since the last reunion, who I didn't see often, was not particularly close to, but she had been following me for a while. And she said, I'll pay your rent. I'll pay your March rent. And I said, I live in New York. My rent is this, feel free to back out. And she said, no, I'll pay your rent. And afterwards I thanked her a million times. I said, oh my gosh, I can't even believe you did that. Thank you so much. And she said, you were very clear. You said, listen to what the person's saying, make a suggestion and execute. And I just did that. But for me, it was like answered prayer. It was, I was honest and vulnerable, ashamed to need this. And what I asked for was answered because somebody listened to what I wrote. Awesome. Yeah, it made all the difference. So rebuild is who are the people in your network? Because we think of, okay, who's going to refer people to my business? That's how we think of networks typically. And what I realized when my husband was gone, how many roles he filled in my life, my cheerleader, my comforter, you know, how much, and, and that was all gone. And my network was not designed to step up into those roles. And so I started thinking about my network as, a, as something different. You know, who was I now? And what did I need now in terms of network? You know, someone to go out with, someone to exercise with. The business as well. But I started thinking about what were the resources that I needed as a person reciprocally and building that. And typically what we do is we lose people out of our lives with every transition and every loss, and we wait for someone else to just show up. But what if you didn't do that? What if you actually went looking, were open to and knew what you needed and just started thinking, okay, would be the best person for this to step in here. So ghosts. Let's talk about ghosts, butterfly kisses. My husband was a very active ghost, especially at the beginning. I was really down one day and he, uh, I was in the bedroom and the living room is another room and the television went on in the living room. And I said, come on, Dave, just cut it out. I'm not, I, I developed a habit of talking aloud I to do. him. I do too. <laughs> yep. <laughs> And I'm like, cut it out. You know, I'm just not in the mood to muck around. I don't want to watch television. Just stop it. And turned off the television, went back in the bedroom and the television went back on. And I came out, I'm like, Dave, come on, I'm serious. And, and in that moment, I pulled, pulled it out of the wall because <laughs> I was pretty sure that he couldn't do that. You know, I was, I was used to him weighing in on decisions. So when I was kerfluffling over some decision that I was making, I would ask it out loud. I would say, hey, Dave, what do you think about that? And my phone, which was very often across the room, would start playing songs that gave me the answer. Sequence of three songs. He went places with me. So he went specifically to vibroacoustics, which both healing modalities places, and to singing bowls. At singing bowls, he would, the, the person who did it could hear him and he would tell her jokes or things that only he and I knew, like dirty jokes. And she would say, he just said that I'm like, oh my gosh, yep, that's totally him. Whenever I went there with him, both alone and with other people, he would blow out all the candles. We would come in, the candles would be lit. Eventually, he started going there on his own. Uh, so she could hear him 
and and sense see his presence so my my ability is sense more than anything else when i went to the vibroacoustics that woman has the capacity to both see him see what he's seeing so she described what his life is like now to me and she said that he was talking about how beautiful it was where he was. And he showed her 360 degree landscape that he was painting. And colors, he said, the colors were nothing I could possibly imagine. But since he, since he died, he's done a lot of going both to the vibroacoustics place and to the healing bowls place and helping other people lighten up realize that life doesn't have to be so heavy. So he's done sort of a lot of service since he died. Another that's in the book that I wrote, which is a ghost story. I was going up to um, do a writing workshop and it was the first time I'd traveled anywhere. And I knew that he could travel with me because he had traveled with me all over New York, but I sort of hoped that he couldn't travel with me up to Cooperstown because I was tired. So we're on the, the bus going up and they're stopped at a rest stop. And suddenly there's a, a hammering on the door and someone's shouting at me, is your husband on the bus? And I burst into tears because I realized that he was on the bus. We went up to the writing workshop, sat down, and all the lights went out in the four light bulbs above our head. And the, the woman who was leading the workshop said, oh man, I'm, I'm so sorry, I just changed all the bulbs. I'll have to have my husband check them again. I said, no, don't worry, it's Dave. And they all came on again. And at the end of the workshop, I was being down on myself. And I said, you know, this thing I've written, I'm sure it's, it's awful. I'm not sure you even want to hear it. And the bulb over my head went out. And I said, okay, Dave, I'll stop being hard on myself. And it turned on again. So he's very direct in his communications. Whenever I'm, I've been most alone, he has been all in, you know, either, either cheering me up or giving me a good kick. He was very instrumental in my finding my boyfriend. When I was ready to risk love again, you know, because he died in my arms and I knew exactly what it was to have that experience and to sort of lose the love of my life for 25 years. And the idea of risking that again was terrifying. The last time I dated was 1992. And, and also every time I felt desire, I felt like I was betraying my husband. And I knew in my head that that wasn't true, except in my heart, sure felt true. And that's, you know, the love story is a whole story in itself, but he was very intent so I started on Bumble, a dating app, which didn't exist in 1992. And I knew I was getting closer when I started liking guys who were less than three hours away. <laughs> I was like, okay, they're in New York. I can actually meet them. And so I had a date with this young guy for brunch. And then that same day, this other guy reached out to me, Wayne, and I had said to him, you know, I'm going to go see this movie or that movie because it's such a hot day and let's get together one day. And he wrote back and he said, let's go to one of the movies I said and have one day be today. And I thought, okay. And we, we started dating. And the thing that was weird about it was that I couldn't trust my own chemistry. After 25 years with one man, 
the place the other person's hand fell on my waist felt wrong. The lips were wrong. Everything was wrong. So my chemistry couldn't be trusted. I was trying to date when someone trying to kiss me caused a panic attack. But this one guy kept rising to the surface. And I was a nut. I was a hot mess, crying all the time. It was going towards the, my second year. And he just, as long as I was willing to be honest, he was willing to hang in. So there was a time, my husband died September 10th. Our 20th wedding anniversary was October 5th. Then there was Thanksgiving. Then Dave's birthday is December 21st. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so like sometime in October, I called him up and I said, you know, you might just not want to see me until January. It's going to be a rough road for me. Just, you know, bow out till Jan January, give me some space and then I'll be back. And then two days later, I called him up and I said, you know, I'm going to meet my mom and see my cousin's movie at MoMA. Do you want to come and meet my mother? <laughs> <laughs> so this poor man, you know, he was just riding the tiger because my moods were all over the place. And our deal was, as long as I was gonna be honest, he was okay. But because I couldn't trust my own chemistry, because he might touch me on a bad day and I would say, get back, don't touch me. And then I would have to explain. I had to own my own stuff. It was necessary for us to survive. So whenever I'd have a reaction that was just a strange reaction, I would have to ask myself, is it me, is it him, or is it us? Wow. And it was so invaluable because it gave me, what do I do next? If it's me, talking to him about it is not gonna do anything. Because the reactions were so huge, I literally needed to acclimate myself to a different person's touch after decades. It was really hard. Do you think Dave helped you through that process? He he did. He he was he was a rabble rouser. He um, I went over to this guy's place for Christmas. And we were sort of going along, but not beyond a kiss or a hug, not intimate, because I, I couldn't imagine it. It was inconceivable to me. And so I was going over to his place for Christmas and Dave had the notion that I might stay over. And he made me pack pajamas. <laughs> Yeah. And I was dating these two guys on Bumble at this time. And he was getting really angry that I was continuing with this other guy and not going with this guy that he had chosen. So one last ghost piece, I was over at his place and he had gone to the bathroom. I was sleeping in the bed and he came out of the bathroom and there was a man leaning over the bed looking at me. And he got back into bed. There was nobody there. But he saw this man looking at me. Got back into bed, went back to sleep, woke up and told me this story. And I started laughing. And I said, I guess you just met Dave. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, by the way, that's, that's my husband. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's funny. It, and I mean, fortunately, he just rolled with everything. So this is going to be an interesting question to ask and one I don't think I was ever going to ask, but does your boyfriend get along with your husband? He does. My husband is around less now that I've chosen my boyfriend. We've now been together for three years. Very good. And the foundation that we built when I was a, a hot mess means that we we're just really strong. 
Dave, I was really uncomfortable with the idea that Dave might be in the bedroom. And I literally had a talk with him about that. But (laughs) (laughs) but yeah, he's my, my boyfriend. So when I closed out the studio, my husband left me hundreds of paintings, which I moved into the apartment. So my boyfriend lives with 546 of my husband's paintings. Wow. Yep. Which for those who are actually watching the the video of this, the painting behind Allison is one of her husband's paintings. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. I love it. So he's okay enough to live with that. But one of the big challenges as a widow with a a really prolific artist husband. First of all, it's been almost impossible to sell the paintings until just now. So it's taken five years. If you think about just getting rid of clothes and shoes, letting go of those things, those are hard. Letting go of my husband's life work without its breaking my heart has been almost impossible. And so we, we live in this apartment with 546 paintings. And it was a real challenge because his artist friends kept saying to me, well, how are you gonna curate his legacy? And I thought, what about me? I'm the one who's alive and I have my own legacy. And so part of Bad Widow was, this is my legacy. These are the lessons I learned from grief and loss that I can pass on and share and help people with. But it's been a real challenge. You know, where does his work go? Because it could potentially fund my legacy down the road. And how do I make space for me? And how do I make space for my boyfriend? So he moved in and we had talked about moving things, you know, because he's moving into this place with all this stuff of my husband. He moved in, fortunately did not have very much stuff. (laughs) I was about to ask that question. (laughs) And he said, okay, now what are we going to move? Now we had pre-discussed this and I flipped out. I said, what do you mean? What do you mean change? You're all the change I can handle. And we've, we've carved space for him you know, he sort of pushes more space for him and for us periodically until I flip out and then we stop. And that's kind of the pattern. I'm willing to keep pushing my own boundaries and he's willing to be patient and to stop when I need him to stop. Good balance. Really good balance. Mm -hmm. He's amazing. I wrote an entire chapter on him, a really honest chapter on him in the him and us and our courtship in the book. And I asked him if he wanted to edit it and review it before the book came out. And he said, no, you need to say whatever you need to say about us. It's extraordinary. Well, it has to be if David picked him. Exactly. So David knows you pretty well. He has a lot of the qualities of David and a lot of the things that irritated me about David, he doesn't have. <laughs> because you know that the person who's gone is not around to do the stupid stuff. Mm-hmm. So making space for a new person when the other person can now do no wrong mm-hmm. is really hard worth it but really hard I am definitely not at that place where dating is even on the table and I don't know when or if that will ever happen but that's for another chapter learning to to move on not move on because that's not exactly what I'm doing but but I'm still in the physical I'm still in the living and I still get to experience myself in this world And I'm still responsible for that. Yeah, I typically say move forward Mm -hmm. because there isn't moving on. Moving on for me is like bouncing back. Yes. Neither are true. 
Mm -hmm. I'm learning that. Yes, it's it's a new and it's not even a new normal. It's just different. I hate that expression too. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It's like, what is a new normal? It's like, it's just different. That's all I can explain it. But you know, and the one thing that I've brought up before on different episodes is. You know, my husband lost his entire family. He lost his sister, then his mother, then his father. And he never learned how to, or not learned, but processed the grief. And yeah. the fact that you've brought up, you know, you have to move the grief through and feel it. And that is one of the things I have to say that I've been doing. You know, if, if, if I need to cry, I cry. Or if I need to laugh, I laugh. Or if I need to go out and walk, I walk. And, you know, to actually physically move that grief through and not allow it to get stuck is huge. And I honestly feel that that grief is what killed him. Mm -hmm. uh, because he, he did not allow that grief to move through. And he didn't know how. He was never taught. And we're not. No, we're not taught. And, and that is a global crisis, in, in my view, to not not be able to. So grief is an individual experience. It's also a communal experience. And yet there's a certain amount of shaming that goes along with grief. And it worries me. This idea that we can be broken by our grief as opposed to heartbroken from grief. And we shame people who are broken. We see them as less. It's an experience. And it's one that reminds us that we're not only physical and human, but we're also spiritual and we're also souls. And when we yes. leave this body, we continue on. You know, we're all born and we all leave this body behind. And what does that look like? And for you, I mean, Dave, David's was still around after he, re, I call it refocusing because literally Chuck closed his eyes in this world and opened them in, in, in the spiritual world. And he just kind of refocused his energy from the physical to the spiritual. And, you know, that's what we, that's what happens, but he's still here. But he just speaks to me in a, in a different language, like, you know, Chinese or something or Mandarin, I guess. <laughs> and I just have to learn his new language. Yeah, people, it's way more common than anyone thinks. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Very much I had so. A, a doorman who lost his wife. And he said, you know, she, she never comes to me. She never comes to me. And yet, his, his sister came with a message from her, his cousin came and said some, you know, <laughs> there were all these people bringing him messages from her that he was not accepting as from her because she didn't show up. Yeah. I actually watched or listened to a, um, a podcast this morning that was rather interesting. And it was talking about the fact that we can tune into the spirit world. And it's like, if you want to listen to a, a, a song on 107, you know, FM 107.9, but you're on AM 99.7, you're not going to hear that song on that 107.9 until you turn into that station. So you literally have to change your, your, your radio station to another station in order to connect to, to that, that spirit. And and I was like, that's very interesting to think of it in, in that in that manner. Yeah. And it's it's not actually new to me. I was talking to someone who does readings and I said, I'm very comfortable with my dad. I lost my brother when I was 25 and he was 23. And when I picked up his Walkman for we're both old enough to understand oh, Walkman. Yeah. <laughs> Walkman, by the way. <laughs> It was playing uh, Cat Stevens, Oh Very Young. Mm -hmm. And when I would be in the, the deepest despair, I would call his name and he would throw me literally a rope of love, which looked like um, one of those big, big ropes from ocean liners, a rope that looked like that. Wow. And then my aunt died and she would travel around with me. You know, I took a coat to a tailor and someone could see that way. 
and said that she was traveling at my third eye. Well, it's inter- it's interesting because they they're 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 with us wherever we go, and it's looking for the signs and being able to notice the signs and see the signs. It's just tuning into and being willing to accept. You know, when I see a butterfly, it's actually a message from my dad and and knowing that that where if I turn the radio on and I'm looking for a message uh, the other day, I was wanting to, to hear a message from Chuck and Pure Country was on TV. I turned the TV on and Pure Country was on there. He knows I love George Strait. And that was one of our favorite movies to watch. Although, wow, it was one of my favorite movies and he watched it with me. There we go. <laughs> So it was just like a message from him to me that he was, he was sending me his love, you know, yeah. and that's the way I took it. And I sat there and watched the, watched the movie and cried all the way through it. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. it was, it was just a really tender moment for me. Of course. Yeah. And there's a, there's a, um, a healing to yes. acknowledging that the love lives on all about love. It's all about love. Well, Allison, I want to thank you so much for being a part of Butterfly Kisses and joining us today. And I do ask one question of all of my guests. If you were able to sit on a park bench with one person, whether it be dead or alive, and have a conversation with that person for an hour, who would it be? And what would you talk about? It would be my aunt, actually, who passed away in Tangiers. She was about to go on a panel. She had written a book on women of the Moroccan revolution. And I know a lot about Dave's life now, but I don't know about her life now. And I'd like to know what she's up to. She was a really interesting person. Because that chills. She's with you too. Is her book out and published or? Yes. Um, I'll send you the title. I have it in my bookshelf. Oh, I'd love that. That would be interesting. Well, do you have, is there anything you would like to our listeners to know? Where, where can they find your book? About uh, your- they can find my book. They can go to my website, which is badwidow.com. It's also on Amazon if you just want to go straight to Amazon. So that's, that's how to find me for everything. Well, The Bad Widow Guide to Life After Loss, Moving Through Grief to Live and Love Again. Now you also do coaching as well. I do. And and inside the book, there are links for a call on the website. There are links for a call. Uh, I work with people through how do you re-engage, reinvent, and rebuild your life after loss, including love. And it's not so easy to do on your own to come back out of that moment. So that's what I help people with. Well, thank you again, Allison. I appreciate your time today. And thank you so much for your story and your journey. You've been an inspiration. And I just uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you for joining me on another episode of Butterfly Kisses, a journey of spiritual transformation. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe by hitting the subscribe button. This way you won't miss it when a new episode is released. Also join me on the Facebook page at Butterfly Kisses Podcast. Here we can continue the conversations we've been discussing on these podcasts, and you can also ask questions of our guests as well. Also, if you're interested in learning more about Akashic Record readings, you can schedule a free 15-minute consultation with me on the Facebook page, or you can do so by visiting my website at amygraycunningham.com. Again, thank you, and remember... Always spread your gorgeous wings, my friend, and fly. Until next time, see ya.